Yeah, you lose your name, your family will never know. You lose all your friends, you have nobody. And if you are arrested, we don't know you. And then all sorts of people started in the neighborhood asking about me, my family, everybody, I, security clearance. It was uh, worth every minute of it, I think, and I hope that, that people realize how, how important the, the women were in, in the OSS effort. He got to talking and he, and he found out that I had been studying Japanese and that I was a newspaper woman. And uh, he said, well, would you like to work for the government? And, and I said, well, yeah, but on one condition that I want to go overseas because that's where I think all the action is. And he said, I think I can guarantee that. And I said, well, then what would I do? And he said, I can't tell you until you sign up with us. And then that's how I, I got in. I was curious, but I did want to see some action. And that was what happened to me. That there was a sizable number of Czechs and Slovaks working as labor for the Germans. So we hit them with a leaflet called uh, uh, on, well, inviting them to cross the lines. And for that, uh, 600 guys that crossed the lines and deprived the German army of labor, I got my bronze star. Uh, I mean, London was not a, not a walk in the park. We had the V1s and V2s in the, from 40s. Um, and a few Dorniers, Junkers, and I mean, <laughs> there was the London Docks were known as Buzzbomb Alley, and uh, it really wasn't um, wasn't fun. <laughs> but I mean, we were all fatalists, and uh, if your name's on it, so be it. If you survive, well, lucky you. Um, the story was. If you heard a V2, uh, chances are you'd survive. If you didn't, it didn't matter anyway, because you'd be gone. The V1s were nasty. They really were very nasty. You all didn't have those, did you? No. But the king and queen would always go. The flag, the, the royal standard always flew on Buckingham Palace. They never left London, and they would go down to where the worst bombing had been uh, in person. And, oh, what a morale builder, and so would Churchill. Uh, believe you me, uh, the war plans, I think I'm right in saying the German war plans, are America was next. Uh, and the U-boats were all ready, and uh, if, if, if that had happened, uh, you'd all be speaking German on one coast and Japanese on the other, probably. Guide for Lovers. Visit the inspiring Eiffel Tower, Secret Notre Dame Cathedral, quaint villages, intimate cafes. Romantic surroundings <laughs> and the utmost hospitality Europe has to offer.
well, I need only to be near a cork of a bottle and I get the full benefit of it. But here I got a glass of something pressed into my hand and I sipped out of it and meandered until I came to the terrace where General Donovan, surrounded by junior officers, was trying to hit a target across from that terrace on a, on a facing slope. And as he noticed me, he said, try your luck, soldier. Well, I always had poor eyesight, and I had already two sips of the drink, whatever it was, but order is order, so I clicked my heels, saluted and said, by you leave, sir, and grabbed that 45, aimed that 45 in the direction of the target. My goodness, to my great surprise and surprise of everybody else, the target responded. <laughs> <laughs> then I quickly opened the 45 pistol, threw out the casing, turned it back, said thank you, made an about face and marched off <laughs> in a straight line, more or less. <laughs> So this is how I met General Donovan, my one and only encounter. But since that day at the Algiers headquarters, I was known as a sharpshooter. For gallantry in action and an unwavering steadfastness to the principles of liberty, equality and brotherhood, we proudly extend to you the highest honor in France, la Légion d'honneur. Bonsoir Manon, I'm sorry to call you over on such short notice, but we have an important new mission. Remember that Danish boy who lives below me? You know, Niels, the one who keeps asking me about the resistance. He's always saying that he wants to join because his home country is occupied just like France. I didn't think he was serious, but tonight he's brought me a tip that we should definitely take advantage of. Remember how the Nazis took over the Paris Academy of Music and started using it as a makeshift armory? Niels said that they're transferring a whole truckload of ordnance later tonight from there to the Gestapo field office in Dubuisson. He stole a copy of the manifest and showed it to me. The truck will be carrying crates of ammunition, explosives, small arms, and even a few heavy machine guns. Just the kind of supplies we need to restock our weapons cache. I will need you to be my lookout tonight while I hijack the truck. It should be fairly simple since the Germans won't be expecting us. When this is all over, we may have a new member for our little resistance team. As always, if we get separated, Head for the catacombs and meet up with the people there. Tell them you're my sister and they will help you. It's getting late. We'd better move out. In direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany spent the 1930s rebuilding their military into a massive fighting force that Hitler planned to use in his conquest of Europe. In response, the French government poured their resources into the Maginot Line, a massive self-contained fortification that ran the entire length of their eastern border. Unfortunately, the Maginot Line turned out to be one of the greatest miscalculations of modern military history. Germany's Luftwaffe simply flew over it. France's formal surrender was finalized in just a matter of weeks. Good morning, Mademoiselle Baptiste. My name is Colonel Hargrove. I'm from the Office of Strategic Services. I heard you've been looking for us. To be honest, we've been looking for you. We just didn't know it. Now, I'm sorry to be crass, but while we've been aware of your brother Jacques for some time, we had never heard of Manon Baptiste until you made contact with our station chief yesterday morning. We knew your brother occasionally worked with another assistance member. I'm just sorry to say that I assumed it was another man. He was wise to keep your identity a secret. I've seen several good operatives denounced by people they thought they could trust. With both your anonymity and your brother gone, 
You could have easily opted to return to a quiet civilian life. You could have even collaborated. Turning over those papers you collected to the Gestapo would have earned you a lot of special privileges under the German authority. Instead, you committed yourself to a life on the run, away from everyone and everything you've ever known. From the looks of your G2 debriefing, you and your brother found yourselves in some pretty hairy situations during the early days of the occupation. And it's exactly that kind of experience we need to employ if our intelligence operations are to stand a chance. We're preparing to launch a major assault in North Africa very soon. Unfortunately, all the men we've sent down to do reconnaissance have had their covers blown. Now, as serendipity would have it, we've learned that a Vichy propaganda magazine has sent a female correspondent all the way to Casablanca to profile the brave men of the Africa Corps. We want you to intercept this woman and take her place. It should provide the ideal cover for getting in there and seeing what Rommel is up to. And if the opportunity presents itself, we want you to take action to disrupt his operations. If successful, your exfiltration will be by airplane, specifically in an old Northrop Alpha that's perfectly suited for this kind of special operation. The pilot is a lieutenant in the Air Transport Command who's been given strict orders not to even look at you, as we don't want to compromise your identity in any way. You'll be briefed on the rest of the specifics during your transit to the African continent. It's a privilege for the OSS that you want to join our ranks. Be careful and good luck. I'll see you when you get back. Tanks were a cornerstone of the Nazi Blitzkrieg attack strategy. Though armored fighting vehicles were developed on all sides, it was General Heinz Guderian of the German army whose groundbreaking strategies and tactics led to the creation of the dreaded panzer divisions he later commanded. Other generals, such as Rommel, used the destructive power of these multi-ton armor-plated Goliaths to put Germany far ahead of the Allies in the early days of the war. It's good to see you back from North Africa in one piece. There's no time to waste as we have a tricky new assignment for you. As part of a continuing mission to legitimize their bloodthirsty conquest, the Nazis have announced a major archaeological excavation on the Greek island of Crete. Unfortunately for the priceless architecture and relics there, the Germans are defacing, not digging. Although the Third Reich only dates back a decade, the Nazis are desperately trying to establish their pedigree as one that stretches all the way back to antiquity. Employing phony archaeologists with forged credentials, the Germans are planting evidence, doctrine reports, and even going so far as to carve swastikas into the walls of these ancient ruins. Normally, this pathetic propaganda effort would not be worth our attention. But the dig is also serving as cover for the installation of a massive artillery battery that, if allowed to become operational, would bring Allied shipping to a halt in the region. We cannot allow that to happen, especially at this crucial stage of the war. These guns are heavily fortified within the excavated sublevels of the coastal wall. Obviously, because of the historic location, airstrikes are currently out of the question. That's why we're sending you in. Since it worked well in Casablanca, you'll be undercover again as a foreign correspondent armed with a camera. Your mission is to infiltrate the dig and prevent further molestation of the site. Then locate the big guns and carefully take them out of commission. You'll travel to Crete aboard a stolen Italian trawler. Be at the dock by 0800 hours tomorrow morning. Bon voyage. By 1940, the combined armed forces of Nazi Germany were unlike anything the modern world had ever seen. After their brutal success in Poland, the Wehrmacht prepared to unleash their lightning war against the West. It was over quickly. You've been on some tough assignments, Manon, but this time we're sending you to a rather dark place. This, of course, is Heinrich Himmler, Reichsfuhrer of the SS. One of the more pitiful excuses for a human being that you'll ever encounter. Did you know he was a fertilizer salesman before the war? 
the quality of his current product isn't much different. He spent the last few years trying to sell Hitler on the creation of an official SS nation state within Germany, establishing a royal class among the master race. Unfortunately, Himmler and the SS seem to be getting their way. The influence of this criminal organization has continued to grow as the war has gone on, to the point that they already have many trappings of an autonomous republic, including their own economy, political system, even their own army, the Waffen-SS, and now it seems their own capital. This is Wevelsburg. It's a castle in the Paderborn region near the town of Buren that Himmler has slowly been converting into his personal palace over the last couple of years. Since the SS has so much power and is responsible for so much within the Third Reich, we've decided to send you inside Wevelsburg to find out what exactly is going on in there. Steal whatever documents you can. They'll not only inform us of their current activities, but they also might prove to be valuable evidence at the inevitable war crimes tribunal for these deviants. Your transport leaves tomorrow morning at 0500 hours. Be extremely careful, Manon. We're not sure what you're going to encounter, except that it's most likely going to be bad. Here is the band of criminals that was the Axis leadership at the beginning of the war. Adolf Hitler, Führer of the Third Reich, the man who personifies true evil. Benito Mussolini, an incompetent thug who sold out his own people. Hermann Göring, the decadent Reich Marshal in charge of the Luftwaffe. And Heinrich Himmler, head of the Nazi SS who oversaw the greatest crimes against humanity. Himmler was a mentally unstable man who truly believed the crazy mythology that he and his fellow SS deviants created in their efforts to establish an independent state within Nazi Germany. Unfortunately, Himmler took his own life before he could be brought to trial, unlike Göring, who was convicted and sentenced to death at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal, and who is no doubt spending eternity with the rest of his friends. There's a new mission that's suddenly opened up, but it's strictly on a volunteer basis. This is the town of Casino, the gateway to Rome. And this is the abbey that sits above Casino, on a small mountain that is the most strategic spot in a most strategic town. The Allies have been stuck here for weeks, unable to take the hill or the abbey from the Germans, and time is running out. Unlike the ruins on Crete, command has made the decision that it's time to attack the site from the air, no matter the consequences to history or scholarship. The Abbey has been there for over 1400 years, and tomorrow, it's going to be bombed into oblivion. Now, here's where it gets complicated. Just within the last hour, we finished translating a message that was transmitted from the Abbey last night. It was written in, of all things, Latin. What it says is quite troubling. The author claims to be a monk sympathetic to the Allied cause, someone who doesn't want to see any more loss of life on either side. Now here's the really distressing part. The monk claims that there are several downed American pilots being held inside as prisoners of war. He says they're confined to cells in the old part of the abbey and would surely be killed in a raid. There certainly have been a lot of airmen from the 8th Air Force lost over Italy, so the monk's claim is not without merit. But let me be clear, Manon. We don't have any independent confirmation of the monk's story, or if he even is a monk. The language and diction check out, but the Nazis have fooled us before. This all just might be a clever ruse on their part to prevent an aerial bombardment. The mission is fairly straightforward. Clandestinely infiltrate the Abbey, rescue the POWs, and disrupt the Germans' operation by destroying whatever equipment you can. The monk's message contained very specific instructions on how to sneak inside which you can read on the plane if you accept this mission. The European air war that started with the RAF in the Battle of Britain was continued by the forces of the Army Air Corps. Nimble fighters piloted by brave young men roamed the countryside, attacking any target of opportunity, disrupting the German war machine on the ground and in the air, while heavy American bombers made daring daylight raids against the Third Reich. But there was a heavy price to be paid. By war's end, almost one out of every ten Americans killed had been a member of the 8th Air Force. Welcome back, Manon. Things around here are going to get even more hectic than they were before. 
The RSS is recruiting a new agent for a very specialized mission, and I think we've got our man. Remember that young ADC pilot who got you out of North Africa a year and a half ago? A lieutenant named Jimmy Patterson? I've kept my eye on him since then, and lo and behold, he just got himself nominated for the Medal of Honor. I'm going to see him tomorrow. If he decides to accept our offer, I want to make you his boss. My gut tells me the two of you will make a good team. Not all the details of his mission have been worked out yet, but I do know that it's got something to do with the Nazis' vengeance weapons program, which brings us to the subject of your next assignment, the V-1 buzz bomb. We've received mixed intelligence over the past two years about their efforts to build a long-range, self-guiding flying bomb, so we weren't sure they'd ever be able to manufacture these weapons in mass quantities. Unfortunately, as we discovered this past week, they have. One of these V1s, powered by its pulse jet engine, can travel from its launch site in the French countryside to the heart of London in about 15 minutes. Some Spitfires on patrol have been able to knock down a few in mid-air, but for the most part, they get through to the city without any trouble. A few of these things have hit near my office at Whitehall, and I can tell you firsthand that it's not a pleasant experience. Some of the junior staff were at a pub that got hit. The impact crater was big enough to park a Liberty ship inside. No traces of the men were ever found. As soon as the 8th Air Force takes out a launch site, new ones spring up like weeds somewhere else. They've even air-launched a few of these missiles from specially modified Luftwaffe bombers. We've got to put a stop to this. Your mission is to disrupt their V-1 manufacturing line and to secure the deployment information for the bombs that have already been shipped out. You leave tonight at 1900 hours. Be careful, Mano, or I'll have to find someone else to watch over this Patterson kid. The ability to precisely hit a long-range target with an explosive warhead was only a theory when the war started. The Allies experimented with radio-controlled drones, while the Japanese used human kamikazes to inflict damage in the Pacific. At their Pennemünde research lab, however, German scientists developed the V-1 flying bomb. Almost 30 feet long, and powered by a pulse jet engine, thousands of these vengeance weapons were launched from sites all over Western Europe, inflicting heavy damage. After the war, captured V-1s were used by the United States to leapfrog into a new realm of guided missile development. Though progress would still have the occasional setback. Time is short, so I'll be brief. With the successful breakout from Normandy by our troops, the Nazis are quickly falling back to their border. Hitler knows that France has been lost, and we've intercepted a communique ordering Dietrich von Schultitz, the general in charge of Paris, to burn the capital before the Allies get there. Apparently, though, Schultitz is having second thoughts about going down in history as the man who extinguished the City of Lights, and the Swedish Consul General has stepped in to broker a ceasefire. Unfortunately, we can't be sure all the junior officers will go along with disobeying a direct order from the Fuhrer, and there are reports of explosives being distributed to key locations around the city. Paris has survived for over four years under Nazi occupation. It would be horrible for it to be destroyed now, on the eve of its liberation. It's time for you to go home, Manon. Good luck. Fighting was fierce as Allied troops battled house to house and town to town in the days following the invasion. Despite heavy casualties, the Allies soon had the upper hand. The Nazi war effort was beginning to collapse. This new swept Paris, where the city erupted as everyday citizens joined with the resistance in rising up against their Nazi occupier. Fear and anguish turned to joy and elation as the last German forces evacuated and the first Allied tanks appeared. What had seemed impossible to even dare think in the darkest days of the Blitzkrieg had unbelievably come true. It's good to see you again, Lieutenant Patterson. I'm sorry to call you in during a well-deserved R&R, but something has come up that we want you to investigate. One of our listening posts picked up this distress call at 2300 hours last night. Hello? Hello? Hello, please respond! This is a message for the airline command. I'm transmitting from Carson Schmielewski. We need help. Stormanfreiheit, I would not listen to reason. He let them loose at the castle. Do you understand? They're taking over. Can anyone, can anyone hear me? Hello? Hello? Please, Berlin continues to ignore our distress call. 
The boys at OSRD have spent all day trying to analyse the sounds you hear in the background, but they can't make heads or tails of it. The castle where the broadcast originated from is on the eastern edge of the Black Forest. There were reports in the late 1930s of a laboratory being set up there for a mysterious purpose, but we've heard nothing since then, until now. Lieutenant, we want you to find out what's going on in there. Your plane leaves in an hour. If we don't hear back from you in two days, we're sending Manon in after you. Dismissed. The First World War. Victory had been ours, but we would soon fail at the peace that followed. Our leaders appeased the growing evil instead of fighting it, sacrificing our future. We vainly reinforced our borders with concrete while we evacuated our children from the cities. There was something terrible brewing with our old enemy, and no one seemed able to stop it. The world was about to find out what happens when an entire nation is swept by madness. What would you do? Surrender? Collaborate? Or resist? You've come a very long way, my friend, and have a strong list of outstanding accomplishments of which to be proud, for demonstrating a seldom-seen fortitude in the face of almost certain defeat, for displaying an uncommon commitment to self-sacrifice, courage, and integrity. You have been awarded the DreamWorks Interactive Medal of Valor with clusters. This commendation is only earned by a very select few, all of us here at DWI send you our sincerest congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>